to SAGE students, let me welcome our speaker this morning, Michelle Decor. Hey everyone, um, so I'm working off two devices. I apologize for that, but my laptop, they, they don't let me have a camera on my laptop here at Los Alamos. So, uh, so I have to use my iPhone. Uh, it's a whole engineering thing, trying to get everything to work together. Um, so can, first of all, can everyone hear me? Okay, thumbs up, all right. Now I won't, while I'm doing the slides, I will have a difficult time seeing you. So Loya has promised me she's gonna keep track of whether you guys uh, have questions or anything, um, just you know, raise your hand if you, if you wanna stop me uh, at any point. I want this to be as interactive uh, as possible in these virtual settings. Um, and, and I know, I mean, that's hard, but I think we can do it. Um, so please, if you have a question, just stop me. Um, so as I said, I'm Michelle DeCroix. Um, I have a bachelor's, master's and doctorate in mechanical engineering. Um, I did uh, grow up in a rural part of Illinois in between two small towns. One was 800 people, one was 1,000 people, and it was 10 minutes to either town. <laughs> I, I had a graduating high school class of 118, um, so it was, it was a pretty small school I went to. Um, I maxed out all the science and math that I could take by the time I was a junior, um, except I didn't take biology too because I am not a person who likes biology very much. I know I know biology is good with you know a lot of people and it's very different than it was back when I was going to school. But I was not a biology person, so I chose not to take the second biology class. Um, I did get a co-op in high school in my senior year. I highly recommend it if you're if you are headed to having a lot of your credits. Uh, by the time you're a senior, getting a co-op position in high school is an entryway into internships uh, later on. My co-op was at the uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture facility that was in Peoria, Illinois, um, and I ran chemical, uh, chemical uh, analysis of different agriculture products. So people would send in corn and they'd want to know how much nitrogen was in it. And so that's kind of what I did in high school. But it was a STEM related thing and it kept me interested in STEM. Um, and so then I entered into uh, uh, college uh, in engineering. So I've always liked chemistry and, and, and that's why I did um, propulsion engineering. So let's see. Um, so speaking of propulsion engineering, if anybody got the slides ahead of time and happened to look at the, the link on the right hand side there, that is the RS-25 uh, rocket engine built by Aerojet Rocketdyne. Um, I worked for an earlier version of Rocketdyne in Canoga Park, California. Um, so here's this rural, small town woman who graduates with a bachelor. Oh, actually I graduated with my master's in engineering at that point and I got an offer to go to California, to go to Southern California and uh, work on uh, rocket engines for the National Aerospace Plane Project. It was an amazing opportunity and I could have very easily turned it down because I was scared out of my mind to move from rural Illinois to Southern California. Literally when I went out to Southern California for my interview was the day of the Whittier earthquake. So I flew in about eight hours after the Whittier earthquake. <laughs> what an introduction to California. <laughs> so, so I could have very easily turned it down, but I'm ever so glad that I did not turn that opportunity down because I got to work on engines. I didn't actually work on the RS-25. That's an engine there and it is under research now and being tested by NASA for the Artemis uh, project to go to the moon again. And so uh, that RS-25 rocket's actually being rebuilt. But what's cool, I don't know if you guys can see my pointer, but you can see the cone of the combustion down here where you're gonna get most of your thrust. There's actually a little graphic. Everything outside of that is pretty chaotic flow, but this is your thrust cone right here uh, to push against the, the air and push you into orbit. And there are four of these on the rocket to take uh, to get out of the atmosphere. So it's pretty cool. I like it. Um, so what, today, what we're going to talk about is what kind of academic backgrounds does it take to work at a national lab? But I'm probably going to 
open the conversation up. You guys can talk to me about industry if you want and about specifically engineering. I do know science pretty well because I work with a bunch of scientists and then we have a bunch of scientists on the line too. So we, if I don't know the answer, other people can jump in. One of the questions we wanted to give you is, do you need to be in school forever, like I was, <laughs> to do things at the national labs or anywhere? And so we're gonna kind of go through some slides and I'm gonna show you some resources. Um, I, I have a lot of words on my slides because I wanted you guys to have them as resources. Um, I'm not gonna go through every word on my slides, but if you have questions, let me know. So first thing I wanna cover is, what is the difference between a job, a profession, and a career? You hear those words all the time, they get thrown around. If you read the news, it's like, well, what are all these things? I'll tell you, I had no idea there was a difference when I graduated from high school um, because I just knew I needed to get a job. Um, my parents were very interested in me going to college, which was a, a, a big plus when I came from this family that had never had anybody go to college, but they were very interested in me going to college. They were one of the reasons I actually made it through a four-year engineering program. Um, but I knew that I needed to get a job because my parents couldn't support me. Um, so, so I had to have a job. Um, and so a job is something that you do that gets you that paycheck that allows you to be living and working, you know, and, and, and doing the fun things that you like to do, your hobbies and all that kind of stuff. But it's that thing that gives you a paycheck. And that's slightly different from a profession. A profession is something that's going to let you get your education and licensing for the occupation that you want. Um, so on the left, I put some of the things that, that use myself as a, an example of what's the difference between a job, a profession, and a career. So I should cover a career is that arc. That, so like I've been 30 years as a mechanical engineer. So my career is that 30 years, right? So I have a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering, a master's degree, and a doctorate in mechanical engineering. I did stop in between my master's and my doctorate, and that's the six years I worked in Southern California in the aerospace industry. So I didn't do that all in one shot. Um, I actually went back to get my doctorate thinking I wanted to teach at a university. Um, but after getting my doctorate, I just decided I wanted to do something else and I got my job at the National Lab. So there, that kind of gives you an idea of what my career has looked like. My profession is that I'm a mechanical engineer because that's where all my licensing and my education and, and uh, training is in. But my, I have jobs that pay me. So right now I'm called a research and development engineer here at LANL. Um, I've been a technical staff engineer in the aerospace industry. I've been a team leader. I've been a program manager. Um, I've also been a drive-through staff at McDonald's. That was one of my first jobs. Um, and I was a softball coach once. Speaking, speaking of baseball, I was a softball coach once. And so those are things that I have been paid to do over my lifetime. But the things that truly are my career are those things that exist within my mechanical engineering. Now, there are people, you know, it's very normal for people to like reorient what their jobs are into different areas. Like you can see, I went from being a program manager to be an R&D engineer. Those are different jobs, but it's still kind of in that area of engineering. So any questions on that? I wanna make sure we had a good grounding in language. You see anything, Lloyd? Uh, no, no, we're good. Okay. All right, so the next thing I wanted to introduce, and this what does have a lot of words on it, but pay attention to the underlined words, okay? So STEM was an academic term that was created to kind of cover what uh, was an area that we felt that, that academics, felt, or academics felt like we weren't educating people in a certain area of, uh, of professions. And so they named it STEM and the, I put the link down at the bottom. And so you can go to the Britannica webpage and read about how STEM became a thing and, and all this other thing. What you need to realize is STEM does not talk about jobs. Um, it kind of covers professions, but it doesn't talk about the jobs. So I wanted to make sure you understood how STEM fit into this, this world we talk about, right? So science 
is a system of knowledge. You're, you're about the physical world. You're studying the physical world. Technology is one of those areas that actually is where you don't need to have advanced degrees to work in technology. This is where a lot of electricians work and mechanical technicians. And um, I'm, I'm gonna probably gear things more towards engineering because I just know that better. But like a, a bio, someone interested in biology can be a biology tech where you work in a lab and you do lab uh, analysis and, and data crunching and things like that. So technology is actually taking some scientific knowledge and trying to make it fit in the human environment. So if I use an electrician as an example, an electrician takes scientific knowledge about how electricity flows and they get educated in that through apprenticeships or credentialing, community college programs, things like that. And they become licensed electricians. So they know the code of how you could like put electricity into a house or a building and then you uh, change and manipulate the human environment, right? So can you imagine having a house without an electrician? No, because you need those electricians to come in and safely wire your house for lights and, and power and all that kind of stuff. So that's kind of the technology side of things. Engineering, which I am, um, is where you take scientific principles and you design and develop things. Um, so, uh, I oftentimes um, someone will walk in and they'll go, I need a, a machine that does this particular thing. And so I have to actually create the design for that and, and, then, and then build it and test it. So that's kind of the difference. Engineering requires slightly more education than technology does, but you can easily start in engineering at the bachelor's level. Um, so if you get a bachelor's degree, which is what my oldest daughter has, is a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering, and she got a very good paying job um, with that bachelor's degree and ended up in Taiwan. How, 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 how bad that can that be, right? <laughs> she's actually working, just to give you an idea, she's a, studying through her, her work, she's studying to be a process engineer for Taiwan Semiconductor. So they're going to be building all of those semiconductor chips that go into our phones and stuff. Um, so that's what she's doing. Um, and so she had all of her education to get her bachelor's, but she still has some apprenticeship work to do in the plant to learn the plant. Um, and then the last thing in STEM is mathematics. And, and I do want math into the science area, but there is a difference between like physics and math you know, physics uses math as, a, as the language for physics. Um, mathematics, you're studying, you're studying the actual equations. And there are, uh, is a lot of overlap actually in aerospace engineering with what we call applied mathematics, where you learn the math, the science of the math, so that you can extend the simulation capabilities that we can do in the engineering world. So there, there are different areas there, but, but mathematics, deals with that logical reasoning and that quantitative calculation. Okay, any questions on that? All right. So now let's talk about jobs because we all would like to get paid for what we want to do, right? So there is this great resource. This is one of the things I pointed my Atalanta students to this summer called the Bureau of Labor Statistics Occupational Outlook Handbook. I know that's a mouthful, um, but I find it being an incredible resource if you don't know what you want to do, because you can compare different jobs um, and, and, and see what you're interested in doing. So if you look at the the web page um, that I've got a picture of. I'm going to go to the web page at the end of the slides. I'm going to go to the web page and we'll do a little searching. But basically, you have all these occupation groups on the left hand side, and then you have all these search fields at the top. And then they actually do allow some browsing for like if you wanted to look at what's the highest paying jobs, um, what is the um, most new jobs? I mean, in other words, they project how, how many new jobs any particular category is going to have. And so, they, um, and so they look at that and they just roll those up. So you can do some, some searching here. 
Um, they do a featured occupation. So today, the day I grabbed this image, the featured occupation was epidemiologists. And then you can just click on the link and you can go read what, well, what does an epidemiologist do? How much do they get paid? How much, how long do they have to be in college? You know, those kinds of things so that you can feel comfortable in comparing different jobs um, based on your interests. Um, so we're going to go to that, like I said, after the slides, I'm going to go to the live website and we can do some searching in real time. Um, but I pulled a couple, uh, this would have been last summer I pulled these, but just to show you how you can compare and contrast two types of jobs in biology. So bioengineers and biomedical engineers, and I know we've got a bioengineer in the audience who's in college, okay. Uh, so you can see that there's a bachelor's degree requirement is the typical entry level education. Um, and then it gives you a salary of uh, uh, average salary of $92,000 a year. Um, and it, it, um, the number of jobs in 2019 was 21,000. It's growing 5%, which is slightly faster than the average growth rate among jobs. But when you compare that to biochemists and biophysicists, so this would be more on the science side of biology. This is on the engineering side. Um, the median pay goes up to 94,000, but the typical entry level education is doctoral or a professional degree. Um, I can tell you it's doctoral, right? Most places are gonna be looking for you to have your doctorate, which means you have to be in school probably at least another three to four years past your bachelor's to get an, the entry level education for a biochemist or biophysicist. So when you're making these comparisons, between two different jobs, you need to take into account that you're, you're not going to be getting that salary for an additional three to four years compared to if you went to bioengineering, okay? So that's a good way of comparing two careers. You may absolutely want that advanced degree and go into you know, a biochemistry position and, and you know, great, that's, that's a great thing to do, but just recognize that you're gonna not be getting that salary for that extra three to four years. And you're actually a lot of times having to pay for your education for that three to four years. So when you look at your career, right, you wanna look at how long you're in school, not getting the salary that you would get with a job and how much you're paying for education and weigh that against other jobs Okay, I had my daughters do this little experiment. Trust me, um, when my young, when my oldest was graduating with her chemical engineering degree, and it was a bachelor's degree, she was considering going to grad school, and a graduate school position was going to cost her about twenty thousand dollars each year for two years to get her graduate degree. She had this offer from Taiwan Semiconductor to be making on the order of $70,000 a year, right? And she had to go to Taiwan. So she can put those two options out on the table and say, well, which one do I want to do, right? Now there's an additional thing to consider is a lot of companies in engineering will pay for your master's degree. So just remember that, okay? It, it went, you know, get your bachelor's and you get onto a company sometimes they will actually pay for your master's degree, which is a benefit because you're getting your salary and they're paying for your education, right? So, so those are the ways to lay out the different options that you're gonna be presented with as you start to look at what jobs. Now, I know a lot of you are in high school and I heard a lot of, I don't really know what I want to do. Well, I, trust me, I didn't know what I wanted to do either. I just knew that I didn't want to be a nurse. Um, I didn't want to be uh, an, a, you know, a teacher or something like that. I was a very non-traditional. They called me a tomboy. That's what they called you back then. In the long time ago, they called you a tomboy um, when you liked sort of the non-traditional uh, areas. Um, and I knew I wanted to do something that was hands-on, that you could build things. And my dad, who was a construction person, worked at Caterpillar Tractor Company, tra tra it was Tractor Corporation now. Um, 
And he's like, I work with a lot of engineers. I think that might be a good thing to do. And so I went to a site very similar to this and probably talked to my high school counselor and said, well, what do engineers do? I had no idea. I had no role model for engineers. <laughs> but the one thing I noticed was engineers get paid a, 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 a good salary. And so I was like, I need a job. So I'll go four years, I'll get this job. And I knew Caterpillar would hire me. And so that's how I ended up getting into engineering. I really didn't know when I started my degree program, if I was going to like it or not. I just knew that's where I was headed. So highly recommend. I know it's really hard to know what you want to do. Um, know what you like to do. And then use resources like this. Talk to your high school counselor. Talk to people in your you know, like uncles and aunts and, and as many people as you can that do different things. Um, and kind of all you need to do is get that first step into college or a credentialing program or something like that and say, I, I kind of want to do that. Um, and I always told my, my, my kids when they were, you know, both of them are daughters, both of them ended up going into engineering programs. Um, but then they have a role model in the house. So that kind of, you know, helps a little bit. But I, I told both of them, you know, start your college education in something that is, that will give you a springboard to other things if you decide that it's not what you want to do. So starting in an area that has, so, so for engineering, your first two years in engineering is a lot of math and science. Um, so it's physics and it's, you know, mechanical engineering is a lot of physics, it's calculus, it's, it's those things that honestly, if you, if you switched over, you could switch over to a physics degree or you could switch over to um, uh, a biology degree or something like that. Those first two years, but if you start off in an art program, it's really hard then you're going to, you're going to probably have to have another year of school to get caught back up to go into any kind of STEM field. So, so those are just kind of the things that I told my kids when they were starting to think about school. I actually, I have to tell this funny story. My oldest in middle school, so both my, I'm an engineer and my husband is an engineer. So my girls are growing up with two engineers for parents. Um, she looks at me in middle school and she goes, mom, do I have to be an engineer? And I said, no, you do not have to be an engineer. <laughs> I said, you have to get a job. <laughs> so, so that was our role was that whatever they were studying, they had to be able to get a job. <laughs> so, so it turned out she ended up in engineering anyway, but it, it, in middle school, she wasn't quite so sure about it. <laughs> All right, so, um, so that's how we're going to use the, the website. Um, I also wanted to cover real quick in the slides that there are STEM jobs that, like we've talked about, need less than a bachelor's degree. And this can fit for people who are just not sure what they want to do yet. And college is expensive. It's not, it's not an inexpensive thing to do. Um, and so getting into community college programs um, that, that are getting you a credentialing um, are, is a really good option if you're not sure you, what you want to do and you can't get in, you know, you just don't want to go to college yet. So on the left, I put some options for education. There's an associate's degree. A lot of the technician jobs don't require more than a two-year community college degree. They want you trained in, in lab techniques and things like that. There are certificate programs. Those are for things like my mom went back to school <laughs> and became a, it was called, called a, I think Lois said it's now called a LVN. It was an LPN when she went in a licensed professional nurse, which was a credentialing program. So she went back to school at a community college for a couple of years and she became a nurse when I was in, I, I was in high school when she did that. So it's one of those things where there are options where um, you can just get a certificate program in certain programs. Um, the, the bureau, the, the website that I was showing you will have those jobs on there. Um, an apprenticeship. Um, so I should tell you, I am one of seven children. So I have six brothers and sisters. 
I, um, my oldest sister and I both have doctorates, but um, many, so I have a, I, my oldest sister has a doctorate, which she got much later in life. I have a doctorate. <clears throat> my younger sister is a stay-at-home mom and now becoming an educator. My, the oldest of my younger brothers is, a, is an educator um, in, high, in uh, elementary school. Um, and then I have a couple folks uh, who have studied business and are in working at Caterpillar. And then one of my younger brothers drives uh, a truck of steel uh, rods around the, the town all, all day, every day. Um, they all have kids. And in those, in those kids, there is a whole variety of different professions that my family has chosen. Um, some have gone to college, but many of them went through apprenticeship programs like an electrician's program or a program for um, doing heating and air conditioning uh, and things like that. And they are all very well-paying jobs. <laughs> so those are all options that are out there. Uh, and then um, post-secondary school courses are kind of used in concert with the certificate programs where you go to a community college and you do a certificate. Oops. So the fastest growing STEM jobs that don't require a bachelor's degree, um, and this is projected for 10 years, uh, web-based stuff, uh, computer users. So you can see IT is a big area where you wouldn't have to get a four-year degree. Um, I will tell you one that's not on here that I don't see. Uh, wind turbine technicians is a huge area right now for non four year degree programs. And a lot of the companies will actually pay for your education and apprenticeship. So, um, so that's, a, that's one that's not on here. Uh, drafters, people who use um, programs to do drafting and stuff. On the right, uh, I was able to find some places that had some, some uh, salary information for these kinds of jobs. So not bad paying jobs, considering you don't have to be in a four year degree program. Okay, uh, like I said, I'm, I'm, these things are yours. I know Loy is gonna send out the slides if she hasn't already. So these are yours to, to have for references. So what I wanted to go over um, before we, we turn into a Q&A and, and everything is that we at the National Labs, um, when we run these camps, you see a lot of people who have gotten advanced degrees because the National Lab science areas really require that. But there are other places, other jobs within the national labs that require a whole variety of uh, different um, educational requirements. So I, I went to the DOE website and I tried to find something that showed all the different jobs that happen at national labs. So if we start uh, here, there's some management jobs, but this is the one that I think you guys um, might wanna look at um, especially if you're looking for like internships at a national lab near you. A lot of operations folks like to have summer students come in and work in the summertime. I know Lanel does. Um, in our safety and operations folks um, and things like that. IT, like I said, our IT programs don't always require a four-year degree. Um, I would be considered to be in the technical research staff here. Um, there's also operations support staff. So a lot of business roles here in, in, uh, in HR and things like that. And then we have our, our student programs. If you live near a national lab, and I did put the map up here. So there are 17 national labs across the country. Okay, and I know many of you are in California. So you're gonna be sitting up here around Berkeley and Slack. I'm here in Los Alamos. Sandia has two, Sandia is split between California um, and, um, and uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico. So they have two, their, their lab is the one lab, but it's split between two locations. Um, uh, let's see, there are some, um, like I grew up, at, oops, sorry. I grew up in central Illinois, so I was right here. Um, Fermi Lab and Argonne Lab are in Illinois here. Um, there are some on the East Coast. Oak Ridge is an interesting one. I don't know if we have any, anybody from Oak Ridge today, um, but Oak Ridge is in Tennessee. Um, and, uh, and, so, and then Pacific Northwest and Idaho are up here. So we, you can see the national labs are all across the country and you can find areas um, 
There's one in Colorado for renewable energy. Um, the DOE websites I put on the slide are good resources for you. There's a video, 17 labs in 17 minutes, and you can go see what each of the labs is, is kind of specializing in. And it's pretty, it's a pretty cool little video. If you have, I didn't have time to play it today because it's 17 minutes. The labs are divided up between Office of Science Labs. I work in a National Nuclear Security Administration lab because we have responsibility for nuclear, uh, nuclear weapon deterrent. And then there are energy lab, you know, the energy labs like the one in Colorado is the National Renewable Energy Lab. They do a lot of research in solar and wind and things like that. So I encourage you to take a look at it. The, the 17 minute video is, is well worth your time um, to kind of take a look. And, and every one of these labs will have some level of student programs so that you can um, view the, the, you can go to their web page. And actually, why don't I do that right now, Loy? I'm gonna yes. share my other screen here. Uh, Hang on a minute, I gotta reshare it all. Yeah, so while, while Michelle is doing that, uh, yeah, thank you, Ashley. I was going to suggest anybody uh, type your questions in the chat. So do you know a lab that specializes in engineering? That's a question from Ashley. Okay, so um, all, the, all the labs will have engineers doing different things based on their specialties. Um, so, um, uh, the, the main one that I think about um, that would have like a, a real cohort of, of engineers, meaning the engineers are in, a, in an organization, um, is uh, Sandia National Labs. They do a lot of the component uh, testing and things that we, we have for our different weapon systems. Um, but every lab will have some level of engineering. If you're interested in engineering for uh, energy, like weapons and I'm mean, not weapons on um, like uh, solar and wind and things like that. The National Renew Renewable Energy Lab in Colorado is cool. And it also actually has a pretty interesting area. You could explore the Denver area. It's really uh, a lot of outdoor hiking and biking and all that kind of stuff. It's a really cool place to go. And Michelle, that uh, yes, our guests from, or our volunteers from Lawrence Livermore Lab said, we have engineers too. And also Scott and Michelle, like we're engineers. So <laughs> do you want to chime in, Joanna uh, and Michelle and Scott at this time? I think Scott should talk about his really cool job at the cryo plant. Yeah, what is cryo, Scott? Is that when you cry, cry a lot? <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully not. Um, hopefully we don't do anything that bad. Um, no, uh, so basically we're, I don't know how much, and well, most people I think had some exposure to the lab, but uh, so part of the, part of the linear accelerator and the upgrade that we've done recently uh, to improve its efficiency and allow us to improve the repetition rate or the exposure rate, uh, and as well as the power is to have the front part be superconducting. Uh, and so for that, um, they have to get a material in which in this case is niobium to the superconducting state and it doesn't reach that till very cold temperatures which uh, in this case is two kelvin or negative 456 degrees fahrenheit uh, and so to, to basically my job is to work uh, at the plant that does a closed loop helium refrigeration system that uh, brings helium from ambient uh, temperature and pressure to sub atmospheric uh, temp or some atmospheric pressures and those cold temperatures and then it's, um, it's a closed loop, so it's a continuous process that hopefully doesn't lose too much helium because uh, I'm not sure as how much you guys know, but helium is a limited resource, uh, and so we don't want to lose it as well as it's quite expensive. So uh, we want to minimize the cost there. So there, uh, I guess currently, uh, this week actually, we're, we're working on starting to do some gas circulation, and they're searching for all these finite leaks that are in tens of negative five cent of uh, cubic centimeters per second. Uh, so, you know, they're very minute leaks that, that they're trying to make sure we don't have in the system before they turn it on. So I'm sorry, that's a little bit long explanation. Thank you. Um, wow. So I brought the Slack page up. Can you see it? You see, yes, we can see the Slack uh, page. So this is the, the um, 
uh, National Accelerator Laboratory webpage. And the reason I wanted to bring web pages up, one, I knew I had volunteers who could speak to their individual labs, um, but I also wanted to walk through um, kind of, if you want to look at jobs at any of the national labs, they all have web pages and you're looking for something that says like job seekers. And so you go here and you click on this and you can explore the different jobs that are available uh, currently open at the individual laboratories. So I'm gonna pop over to Los Alamos just because I know Los Alamos' web page better <laughs> than I know other people's. But our web page, if you, I'm gonna go back to the main page here, if I can, here we go. Uh, it's not letting me for some reason. Okay, so I'm actually on, to get to the job page, you go up here to careers. And you just go down here to say apply for job. And what you'll find is it will, it will pull up a list of our available jobs that we currently have open. All of our student jobs are listed this way too. So you'll go in and you'll see engineering postmasters internship program. So that's if you have a master's degree, you can apply to our internship program there. Um, uh, let's see. Yeah, I know there was another student one I saw earlier, but anyway, um, you will see all different kinds of jobs. And, and the reason I encourage you to go ahead and take a look at not just the student jobs, take a look at any job that kind of, kind of you get, it's like, oh, I wonder what that does. If you click on them like an electrical engineer job, it will give you a job description and you can look at what we're asking for, for minimum job requirements and education and experience. So this is another resource for you to look at while you're considering what you might want to study in college, you can go look at job pages all over the country and see what they are asking for. Um, and you, then you'll have a better idea of what education you might need um, and um, sort of what you might wanna look at studying in school. So I have Los Alamos's page up, I have Oak Ridge's page up, I have Lawrence Livermore. Is anybody from Lawrence Livermore want to talk about their page? Joanna, Hi, it's Joanna. Go ahead. Yeah. So Lawrence Livermore has the National Ignition Facility, which is a multidisciplinary facility that requires a lot of different um, engineers and a technical staff. Um, I think all the laboratories, um, as Michelle has said, have their specialty, but we also have a careers page, careers.lnl.gov. And basically, you know, you can go to any of the laboratory's pages, as she's saying, and, and just look through the kind of jobs that um, are advertised. Um, we have anything you can imagine in STEM going on at all the labs. It's just which, um, niche do you want to um, be in? <laughs> so, um, and a lot of people have careers across the National Lab Complex. They may start at Los Alamos and then come up to Livermore and then go over to Sandia and then over to Slack um, because the cultures are, are very similar. So, so yeah, a so lot of what you. Michelle's saying really applies to all the labs. Thank you, thank you for that, um, Joanna. Uh, Michelle, we do have a question from one mm -hmm. of the comments, and, and it is, um, what were the pros and cons you noticed about getting your doctorate degree after taking a break from school? Uh, the student is, this thing, student is thinking about going to grad school because you have better job opportunities with a grad, with a, with a you know, when, when you go beyond undergraduate, but she's not sure if she wants to go into grad school right after undergraduate. Yeah, so one of the reasons that I decided to go back to grad school after working in the aerospace industry for six years um, was in aerospace, it's very cyclical for hiring and layoffs. And we were going through a very slow uh, time. I was not in danger of getting laid off from, from Rocketdyne, but there really wasn't a lot of work. And I'm a very driven person. I like to be very busy. And so I just, I couldn't see hanging around and waiting for the next project to come down the, the pipe. So I said, I told my husband, because I was married at the time, 
I told my husband, I said, I think I'm going to go back to school and start studying for my doctorate. Um, and I was initially thinking about doing it part time. A doctorate's very hard to do part time because of the research that's required for it. Um, but I was going to give it a try. Um, and then my husband was like, well, maybe I should go back and get my doctorate too, because he had a master's degree in mechanical engineering. And so he's like, well, maybe I should go get mine too. And that meant we couldn't stay in Southern California. So we picked up and moved across the country to North Carolina. And we both became students again. We didn't have, we got assistantships from the university that pay a little bit of money. Um, and we were that, we did that for four and a half years. So I gave up my salary. That's why I wanted to bring up with you guys earlier. I gave up my full-time salary as an engineer to go back to school and get my doctorate. Um, you need to weigh, when you, when you make decisions like that, you need to weigh what's your job, how is that degree gonna help you with your job prospects? You also need to include what, how it makes you feel. It's like, you don't wanna get into a degree program and then say, oh, but I really don't like studying that much, right? So you need to weigh what, how you, are, who you are as a person and as a student, what, how that degree is gonna improve your job prospects after your degree and then weigh that against giving up the salary that you will over that time. So there's no one answer for everybody. Um, it's just you kind of weigh all those factors. Um, I highly encourage you to say, I'm not sure what field you're in. What field, is, is that the bioengineer? <laughs> yep, I am the bioengineer. <laughs> so in bioengineering, just due to the biological, so bioengineering and bioscience are probably two of the closest engineering science um, uh, disciplines, right? There's not a lot. So like for me as a mechanical engineer, um, I'm kind of more distant from any of the basic sciences. I use physics, I use chemistry, I use those kinds of things and I'm not directly in line with another science, right? So biology, that's true. So you kind of get measured by the science, uh, way scientists get measured. And so a graduate degree might be more meaningful in biology than it is in mechanical engineering, okay? But you said you wanted to build things, am I right? Is that, is that what you wanna build things? Yeah, I did wanna build things. <laughs> Thinking like maybe I won't get a grad like degree in specifically bioengineering, maybe I'll switch to like mechanical engineering because I've heard of people doing that. So I'm not sure yes. about like this. Yeah. So, so I would encourage you. So, so I tell a lot of the, the women who approach me, you know, for mentoring and stuff in bio, it's a, it's a, it's really a new field um, from, from that perspective of looking at it as, as an engineer. Bioengineering didn't used to be as big a deal as it is now. So there's multiple paths to explore. And I would be happy to, to have an offline conversation with you about that, okay. Yeah, thank you, Michelle and Jelena. Uh, Joanna's hand is raised, but I also wanted to read a question from a student in case it applies to the conversation or whatever Joanna's ready to share. The question is, do you know if all mo or most colleges allow engineers to switch to a different STEM field within the first two years? Or is that only specific colleges? So a lot of engineering schools, particularly larger ones, are, are going to a program where your first year is, is undeclared. You're, you're declared for engineering, but you're not declared into a discipline. And it's called general engineering. In, gen in general, it's called general engineering. Um, because what they were doing was getting a lot of movement between freshman and sophomore years between disciplines in engineering and also exiting the engineering program to go do something else. So, so um, you, you're already seeing where the educational system is kind of catching up with people not really sure that engineering is what they want. So they've like opened up this opportunity. Both my daughters had to actually wait until they're saw, they had enough credits to be considered a sophomore and then they could declare their engineering discipline. And they, and they had to actually be accepted into the discipline, even though they had already been accepted into the engineering program, they had to be accepted into the engineering discipline. So I have one mechanical and one chemical, so. 
Yeah, Joanna, did you want to um, sh uh, share your comment, whether or not it's related to this question? So mine was back to what um, the the prior question was. So I, I also took off time in between because um, I also now have a 35 year career as a scientist. Where did those years go by? And when, um, when I was an undergraduate, there wasn't a lot of research experience. And so um, I wanted to be in a lab to see if I wanted to have that kind of job and go and commit to the PhD to see if I was gonna like it, right? So, so now, um, all these years later, there's opportunity, so many opportunities for internships. So I was just gonna say that you could try to do an internship at one lab in bioengineering this summer and maybe at a different lab in a different type of engineering next summer. Like an internship is such a good short-term opportunity to get the feel for the field and the career and the place. So th that's why um, you'll hear us as a group at SAGE talk about it all the time because it's, it's, a, it's just a great opportunity to figure out what you like and what you don't like. And there's a woman that I work with in my lab who's a mechanical engineer from Cal Poly and they have to do internships in that program. And exactly for that reason, they're sending their students out in the world to get a little taste of this and a little taste of that and see what's the best fit because the best fit is different for everybody. And for me, um, taking that time, I worked at Rutgers University as a technician and I got exposed to everything that was coming at me in my future that I didn't that I didn't know. I got to do hands-on research. I got to do facilities management. In other words, I was responsible for, you know, the radio, radioactive waste room. You know, you learned, I learned those, those skills that I was going to need later on uh, down the line. So that's my two cents uh, on that. Yeah, having experience of being in the lab actually gives you that that direct experience of what you like and what you don't like. We also have a question about about uh, getting to a, completing a doctorate. What things did you have to do or complete besides research? And what was the hardest part of completing a PhD program? Ah, writing. <laughs> <laughs> Writing was by far the hardest part for me. <laughs> so um, uh, doctorates in engineering, I think are slightly different than doctorates in science, though there is some variability with that depending on which school you go to. So, so um, I, I, this is how I think about it. As, as an engineer at the bachelor's level, I'm being taught all the tools and techniques to do design work. So much of the focus at the bachelor's level, bachelor's level in engineering is about doing design. Um, I don't know about the bio, but <laughs> that's the way it is here in mechanical. Um, like I said, bio is a whole new field. I'm, I'm still learning it myself. Um, then once you get past the design aspects of your bachelor's degree, a master's degree starts to move you into being able to explore more problems that are open-ended and unknown. So a bachelor's degree in a lot of, from a lot of schools is about getting you graduated to go into industry, okay? And you don't do as much, um, you do hands-on work, but you're not doing as much open-ended problem solving. And the reason I stayed, so I got my bachelor's and entered into the master's program immediately to get my master's because I was very interested in doing more open-ended problem solving. And so that's why I stayed for my master's. I had no intention of getting a doctorate at that point, none. Um, what I ended up making that decision, like I said, there was a slowdown in the aerospace industry and I thought I might wanna teach. So I wanted to go back and get a doctorate which is required to do academic um, university level teaching is, is a doctorate. And so I got into my doctorate program and was like, you know, I don't think I wanna teach but I was already in my doctorate program. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna do this. And so my doctorate research, so you, you typically take about 30 more hours of courses that are more science focused. So like I took basic, um, sort of basic advanced chemistry and advanced simulation and things like that in my doctorate program it was much more on the science side than what I'd gotten at my, even at my master's level. And then 
you have this research that you do um, that is a problem. So like I worked, my problem was for the Army Research Lab and I studied what's called unsteady combustion. Um, and that means that I was actually like pulsing the combustion flame to, and then using laser diagnostics to learn what soot production was coming out of this unsteady flame. Um, so it's a very like mechanical chemistry kind of research. So it's very applied. Um, whereas in the science areas, you can have much more, um, you know, or a little less applied research than you do. And I think in, in an engineering world, once you get to the doctorate level, though, there's no standardization. And so each school and each professor will do things slightly differently. Um, so it's at the doctorate level, you really need to like be looking at what you want to be. Why do you want to be doing this? And is your goal in line with what your professor wants to do? And the reason I say that is because your professor determines when your doctorate is finished. Oof. Okay. And if your professor is, a, is someone who wants you to study for six or seven years, remember, you're giving up that salary for six or seven years. <laughs> So I, I always encourage all of my master's students who are looking at PhDs, I said, interview your potential professors, right, that are going to be your academic advisor, interview them and determine what their goals are, then talk to their graduate students and ask them, is this person motivated to get you out to graduate you? So I, I was actually lucky. My my graduate advisor was very motivated to get me out because he was untenured and I was his first PhD student and he couldn't get tenure until I graduated. So I was, he was very motivated to get me out the door. <laughs> wow, Michelle, that is very candid um, comment and feedback, very valuable. We, I've met many PhDs before, but this is the first time I've heard you say, <laughs> yeah, interview that academic advisor, make sure their goals match your goals. Thank you. Yep. What, we, what else we got, why? Yeah, speaking of salary, do you need to pay the school or does the school pay you? Um, in, grad in, school, in, in grad school. Yeah, in, in general for engineering, um, you can usually get an assistantship, um, usually. Um, it, it is somewhat dependent on the local economy and faculty, you know, if the faculty is getting their uh, research grants and, and things like that. And then the university has a certain number of assistantships for their department. Um, there's also the differences teaching assistantships versus research assistantships. So you can get, you know, my, my husband actually, when he started his master's was a teaching assistant because there were no research assistance, assistantships available. So he started as a teaching assistant. And so you, at, at the master's level, you will as a teaching assistant, you will grade, you will grade and, and proctor exams and, and, and maybe, you know, you're a fill in if the professor has an emergency and can't be at class. At the doctorate level with, um, like I taught a couple of thermodynamics classes for my uh, professor, um, for my advisor uh, and things. So it's much more common for you as a, as a doctoral student to actually do some teaching <clears throat> and things, even though you might be on a research assistantship. So, so those are very small, actually very small pay, but they come, oops, they come with, um, I lost my headphone, but they come with uh, tuition remission, which means you don't pay tuition. Um, you know, the, the, the university or the department picks up your tuition, or if there's a funded grant, then it picks up your tuition. That's very common in engineering. Um, I don't think it's as common in science. So, wow, a lot of that yeah, and I, I hear certain universities in certain states are really motivated to get graduate students into their program. Maybe yeah. it's impacted in California, but maybe not in New Mexico or Hawaii. So, uh, other things to consider. At the graduate school level, I actually do encourage people to start looking at at other schools in other areas. One because you have to look at the cost of living. 
um, because you're not going to be make, making very much money. And California is not an inexpensive place to live, right? Yes. Um, so, uh, but, uh, and that is one of the reasons we moved to North Carolina uh, to go to school. Um, the other thing to look at is just being able to explore a new area because you know it's a finite time, right? You're only gonna be in graduate school. Like it took me four and a half years to get my doctorate. Um, and so, so, you know, you're, you're there for a finite amount of time. So it's an interesting place to go do, to, to, to just explore a new area. Michelle, what you mentioned co-op, apprenticeship, and then there's what we know as internships. How, how, do, how different are those three terms? Um, so co-ops are more common in engineering than in science. Um, it would, it, it's called a cooperative uh, agreement between an employer and a school to have a student come. So they're generally, um, it's a program. It's not just an, an individual getting hired in as an individual student getting hired into an individual group, right? Which is the way a lot of student positions are at the national labs is a group looks through all the resumes and they say, we wanna hire this student and you come and work for that group. Whereas a co-op program is generally one run in industry and two is a, a whole program where they hire a cohort of students to come in. And, and I like the co-op programs because they, they tend to have that rotation where they rotate you around the company during the summer. And so you may only spend one or two weeks with a group um, before you move on to your next um, rotation. Or they can do it year to year where you come back. It's a multi-year program and you come back the next year and you go to a new, a new place. So it's an actual, a, a co-op is an actual agreement between an employer and a school. Um, the internships are, at least at the national labs, are sort of these individual jobs that you apply for. And then the apprenticeships are um, in the technician kind of fields. Uh, so like I have, a, a, um, one of my nephews uh, has been an apprentice. He's in his fourth year of his apprenticeship for uh, electrician. Um, it's a multi-U program, usually run either through a community college or through uh, a union. Um, and they have a series of steps that you have to go through and you have to show proficiency at each step before you move on to the next one. But once you reach it, then you've got the licensing to be able to do that field. So plumbers, electricians, um, those kinds of fields will have, but these are paid, they're paid jobs while you're getting your apprenticeship. So does Great. that make sense? Yes, yes, thanks for clarifying that. You shared some job descriptions and I've, I've heard this a lot among college students looking at the job description and qualifications for internships. And many of them say, you know, I don't really meet those qualifications as described in the job description. Because, you know, they talk about uh, accelerator physics and blah, 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 blah. And yet I hear from some insider, you know, sage volunteers at the lab that as long as you show motivation and knowledge and curiosity and passion for the topic, you really have to do on the job training anyway in the lab because it is so unique. So don't worry about meeting or not meeting the qualification as described in the job description. Just apply for the internship and then, and then and hope that the hiring people see your passion and interest in the subject and don't disqualify yourself early enough. What do you think about that? So the best advice I got in early on in my career is don't turn down a job you haven't gotten yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So if that job description is something you're really interested in, right? Don't hesitate to put a job application in, right? Um, they're, they're usually the minimum level that they're looking for, I'll use student positions as an example, you'll see a minimum level of education, right? But there's usually some legal language that says experience plus this, you know, you know experience plus a uh, lower level of education will fit. Um, not generally on our student programs, um, that, that's usually that legal language is probably not there, but for the other ones there is. 
Um, GPA in a student position is important because we all, all the labs will have a minimum GPA that they cannot hire people below that GPA. All right, just recognize it may not be the choice of the group. They may look at your resume and think you're fantastic. Um, but if you haven't met that minimum level of GPA uh, for, the, for the institution, um, so ours is a three, 3.0 at the lab. Um, you have to have a 3.0 in order to be able to be hired um, and to stay as a student. Um, and then the other thing um, is to look at when, it, when you have those skill sets listed, if you don't meet one, talk about how you're passionate about it or how you're very interested in learning more or something along those lines. So that they, you, you, know, you don't, don't ignore it, try and address it in a slightly different way. Maybe you have a different experience that you think is completely relevant, but it doesn't actually like look like it meets that qualification, right? So maybe you had a job experience in a non-STEM field that actually addresses that, that qualification. Don't hesitate to bring that out. I will tell you, I, I don't know if Cassandra, or Cassandra didn't give a talk last week, but at, the, at, the, at LANL, uh, we like to see in your cover letter, basically a point by point addressing the qualifications. So you'll see the qualifications listed as a bulleted list. And we want you to talk to each one of those and say how you meet them, okay? Plus then we want your resume. <laughs> oh. So, and a lot, and I will tell you a lot of industry jobs will have the same requirement and, and it's just not said explicitly, but it's a good way of organizing your information because you've got hiring officials who are trying to pull out information from your resume and it may not be completely obvious that you meet that qualification but you know exactly how to state it that you do, right? And you can't make your resume look like every job ad, but you can take your cover letter and, and address those qualifications, right? And maybe you don't do every one. I've rolled multiple qualifications into one bullet. I'm like, why did you call out three? They are all fit into this category, <laughs> you know? So I've done that before. Um, the other thing I'll tell you, and this is because we're talking to women, uh, women have a tendency to look at job ads and say, I don't meet all these qualifications, so I'm not going to apply for this job. Get rid of that idea. Okay, just get rid of it. If, if you want to apply for the job, apply for the job. Okay. The, the worst thing that's going to happen is some HR person is going to go, nope, she doesn't meet the qualifications, you know. Also, don't be afraid if you really were interested in a job and you didn't get the call. Don't be afraid to pick up the phone and call the person. Email is not good enough. Pick up the phone and call the person's name that's on the job ad. It's usually the HR person because I will tell you, Lanol is not good about getting back to people. We are just lousy at it. And if you call, they can tell you, is the job still open? Uh, what you're, you know, whether you moved forward in the process or not, where they're at in the process, but you won't get any of that information unless you call. Okay. Yeah. Thank Does that you. help, Lloyd? Yeah, <laughs> Michelle, thank you. By the way, whenever Michelle says LANO, that means Los Alamos. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Smile <It's my> on. LANO. <laughs> LANO, Los Alamos. Yeah. That, that is awesome. And uh, now is actually a good time for me to to uh, summarize and close up because um, one of, uh, just a reminder to all the students, we are all members of the SAGE community. And Michelle said, call, call somebody at the lab to follow up on your application. Well, guess what? As a member of the SAGE community, we are also here to support you. So don't hesitate to send me an email, give me a call and just kind of say, hey, why I applied for this internship. Uh, do you have any, you know, advice on how, you know, what I can do, what else I can do, blah, blah, blah. So you never know. Uh, you always use your network and that's, that's what the SAGE community is still for you. My email actually is, is in the email I sent. I've been sending out all those, uh, but I can type it in the chat as well. And this, I actually will end the recording now so we can chat informally. But before I do that, a reminder that the January Sage Live is the topic, how to prepare for an interview. 
<laughs> and our speaker will be from uh, Lawrence Livermore Lab, which is where Joanna is from, the LLNL or LOL, no, however you call that. And uh, for those who are in college now and that are interested in internships, we mentioned back in September, uh, October, the internship programs. It's the summer undergraduate laboratory internships, SULI, and also community college internships, CCI. The deadline is January 12. And so I was inspired by Michelle. If I was a college student now, I would apply because what did Wayne Gretzky, what did Wayne Gretzky say? You miss all the shots that you do not take. In hockey, if you do not take the shot, of course you'll miss it. So you have to take that shot. Send in that application. January 12th is a deadline. And, and let me know if you apply, let me know if you're interested in a job, that way we can see what we can do as a SAGE community. With that, I will end the recording and